recording and I'm going to hand over to you, Robin. Thanks, Paul. Thanks very much for the introduction. I'm just going to try and share my screen. So uh, please bear with me a second while I do that. I hope everybody can see um, the first slide of the presentation. Um, thanks everyone that's joining today. It's, uh, it's uh, six o'clock in the evening in Tokyo. Um, so it's good evening from Tokyo, but I imagine it's good morning for a, a number of people that are joining today. And uh, this session, it's called Bringing EFL Reading Instruction Up to Date. A, a lot of uh, reading instruction is, is based on uh, a lot of foreign uh, reading instruction for foreign languages um, is based on first language research. But unfortunately, a lot of that research is, is actually quite out of date. And that's what I want to look at in today's session and how we can maybe bring some of the, the newer ideas from first language reading instruction into second language or foreign language reading instruction. So I hope you find some of the, the information and ideas in this session um, useful and uh, I hope to leave about 10 minutes at the end of the session for, for questions. So the session aims for today are uh, these. Uh, first of all, we're going to look at some common misconceptions uh, in EFL reading, um, which come from uh, research into first language reading. And these two misconceptions are around speed reading and the role of guessing uh, when, when reading. Then we're going to look at what, what is skilled reading, um, which uh, what the latest research says about how we actually learn to read uh, specifically in English. And I'm going to end with some helpful ideas about teaching reading based on, um, on the, the research into skilled reading and also based on um, some of the, the training and the projects that uh, we've been running in Japan. So to start with some common misconceptions. Um, I'm going to show you some comments that I have come across quite a lot since um, I've been involved in teaching English as a foreign language. And I'm, I'm quite curious to, to know whether you've also come across comments like these. So as I put them up, it'd be quite interesting if you could type in the chat yes or no, uh, based on whether you've actually come across these comments yourselves or not, whether it, maybe it's just, just me that's seen these. So the first comment is, uh, I hear teachers saying things like, run your eyes over the text to get the main idea. And read the first sentence and last sentence of each paragraph. Also, just look for the keywords. Don't worry about the other words. I've heard uh, people saying, we don't read every letter in every word. And don't worry about the spelling. English is not a phonetic language. I'm quite interested to hear whether uh, to see whether or not. Uh, oh, I'm seeing a mixture of no's and yeses. Yes, no, no. Okay. Okay. So interesting. So uh, these are things that some of you have come across, and some of you have not come across. Uh, the latest answer is a yes, and then another yes, and another yes, and another yes. Okay, good. So um, certainly in my experience, this, these, these kind of comments are quite common. Um, and uh, I've seen them, I've heard them, and I've seen this kind of advice in, in training materials and, and even textbooks. So, um, some of the advice on the last slide may be helpful in some situations. I don't want to dismiss all of it, but it often comes from flawed and out of date ideas about reading. And we'll look at two of these ideas, which as you may remember are, are speed reading and guessing. So we're going to start by looking at speed reading. And when I talk about speed reading, I'd like to make a distinction. I'm not talking about fluent reading. So if we're reading fluently, it means we can read the words at the same kind of speed that we could talk if we were talking normally. That's fluent. And if we're reading silently, we can usually read even more quickly than that. Uh, and fluent reading is, of course, a very important and useful thing. 
Um, but the idea of speed reading goes beyond that. Um, speed reading is often associated with the idea that we can read at very high speeds, maybe 600 words per minute or 1,000 words per minute. And that's what I'm, I'm referring to when I talk about speed reading. So speed reading classes um, were common in the US from the 1930s onwards. And speed reading, I think, um, was a phenomenon that, that really was associated with the US in particular, although it later spread to other countries, including the UK um, and all around the world, in fact. Uh, there was one famous figure in the speed reading movement called Evelyn Wood. Uh, she made this idea very popular in the 1960s. She claimed that she personally could read 2,700 words per minute, and some people claimed even higher speeds than that, up to 6,000 words per minute, um, people were claiming. And um, this became very, very widespread, and it was endorsed by famous people, including US President J.F. Kennedy, you can see a picture of him there, Richard Nixon and Jimmy Carter, who all took speed reading courses and, and recommended them to their staff. Speed reading courses became big business and made millions of dollars in sales. Um, so this was a very big phenomenon. And um, by the 1970s, it was well established uh, as part of US education as, uh, at uh, high school and, and university level that, that people would be introduced to speed reading courses and the idea that we can read much more quickly than most people usually do. And you can see why this is attractive. Most people feel like maybe they're they're a little insecure about their reading. They think maybe they, they, they should be able to read more quickly, or maybe they, they have to face a lot of reading in their everyday, everyday lives. And so speed reading can be seen as a, a very attractive idea. So what was taught on these speed reading courses? Well, students were taught eye exercises to increase the number of words they could see when they looked at the page. They were taught to run their finger down the middle of the page in an attempt to, to speed up their reading. And they were told to eliminate subvocalization. Now, subvocalization is where you kind of murmur the words as you're reading. Um, and actually, most people, a large number of people at least, um, have a, a voice in their head as they're reading, which kind of says the words. Uh, but uh, speed reading courses told you to suppress it uh, and, and to try and get rid of any kind of soft vocalization because it slows you down. So this is a very popular movement. What's the evidence about speed reading? Well, unfortunately, we cannot increase the capacity of our eyes to read. So the first um, exercise is really will just no use whatsoever. And when tested, speed reading students had comprehension below 50%. Um, so if you don't really understand half of, the, of what you're reading, that's not as useful maybe as, uh, as we'd hope it would be. In fact, um, really, when it comes down to it, speed reading relies heavily on skimming and scanning. And, and these are the only effects, uh, the only kind of uh, techniques that you that you really learn when you go on a speed reading course. And it's now regarded by most reading specialists as a scam. Uh, this is a, the illustration shows a, a book um, about Evelyn Wood, uh, calling her a scan artist after scanning from skimming and scanning and talking about how she convinced the world that speed reading worked, even though it didn't really work. Um, and in fact, um, she, made some quite dishonest claims. I think she altered data um, that uh, suggested that her speed reading courses were more effective than they really were. Nowadays, it's not really uh, regarded as a credible claim so much anymore, certainly by reading specialists. Now you might be thinking, okay, this is an interesting story, but what has it got to do with teaching English as a foreign language? Well, uh, speed reading techniques um, are also obvious in English as foreign language teaching. The communicative approach to English as a foreign language teaching was born in the 1970s, and this is around the peak of speed reading popularity. And so not surprisingly, um, there are elements of speed reading um, that we find in lessons which follow the communicative approach. In particular, lessons in textbooks often include skimming and scanning 
um, skills practice. I've put the word skills in, um, in inverted commas because I, I don't think these really are skills actually. And teacher training often includes sessions on how to teach skimming and scanning. And certainly uh, when I did my pre-service teacher training, um, there was a big focus on skimming and scanning. And, and often when I look at um, uh, textbooks, uh, teachers' books in textbooks, they talk, they refer to skimming and scanning. It's uh, something that I see quite regularly when I look also um, at the websites of major textbook publishers. Now, I don't want to condemn skimming and scanning out of hand and, and say that they're a complete uh, waste of time. Skimming and scanning are useful, are a useful coping strategy in some situations. For example, if we have a big document to look through in a short time, um, then we may need to rely on skimming and scanning because there's no way we can, we can read it uh, in the time we have available. And this allows us to identify the, the parts that are important especially if we know that some of the information in a document is not going to be interesting or useful for us. Um, but then in that case, skimming and scanning are, uh, are extremely um, valuable strategies. And students may find these coping strategies useful in tightly timed tests uh, with large amounts of reading text, uh, especially um, uh, they don't, if you're reading a, a text and then you're looking at the questions, you don't want to go back and start reading the text from the start again. Uh, you may need to skim and scan your way through the text in order to find the answers to those questions. So it, skimming and scanning can also be um, useful test taking strategies. Although um, I think we can sometimes go too far um, in recommending them even for these purposes. But what's important to know about skimming and scanning is skimming and scanning are more like a strategy than a skill. It's a technique we can choose um, for certain situations. A skill is something that the more you practice it, generally the better you, you get at it. And this is probably not the case so much with skimming and scanning. There's a, uh, maybe if you've never done it before, then, um, then some practice will be helpful, but it's likely to be fairly, um, fairly brief practice that's necessary for doing this, especially if it's a technique that you already use in your first language reading. And we need to bear in mind that skimming and scanning have a, a negative impact on comprehension. And as a result, in many situations, choosing to skim and scan will not be helpful or appropriate. If you need to read something carefully and understand it, then skimming and scanning skills are not useful. They don't transfer. On the other hand, lots of things that we can do in reading lessons do transfer, uh, learning new vocabulary, um, learning new grammatical structures, uh, learning how different kinds of texts are structured. All of this information transfers to any text that we read, whereas skimming and scanning uh, doesn't. As a result, spending a lot of classroom time on skimming and scanning uh, is really an opportunity cost. So uh, I'm not saying we should never teach it. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are, there are times when it's a useful strategy. And if, if students have always been trained to start at the top of a text and read to the bottom, uh, then it's, it's useful to introduce them to the idea that that's not always necessary, that there are some situations when we might want to skip to the end uh, and that we don't always have to read everything with extreme care. However, uh, going back to the point, spending a lot of classroom time on these strategies is an opportunity cost and we could use it for things that are much more effective in helping students to read in any situation. Here's a quote um, from, uh, from Scott Thornbury. Um, who has written a, a many books on uh, English language teaching, and he says, the skimming and scanning of texts in the absence of a more intensive reading is a characteristic not of good readers, but of poor ones. And um, certainly that's my uh, experience with learning uh, Japanese. So I'm actually quite good at skimming and scanning through texts in Japanese. But what would make me a more effective reader is knowing more uh, Japanese kanji characters. Um, I don't need to spend any time skimming and scanning. I, I need to spend time practicing learning a new vocabulary, I think. That's my own self-diagnosis. So despite the lack of evidence, speed reading courses uh, continue to be surprisingly popular around the world. And a video of a recent and extreme version called Quantum Reading uh, went viral in 2019. Went viral means it became very popular on the internet. 
And if you're interested in this, it's in the pre-task. There's a link to the U a YouTube video of, of students doing quantum reading. It's really quite bizarre. The students are literally just flicking through pages in their books um, under the under the understanding that this will uh, help them to become more effective readers. Um, and uh, and obviously, it's very unlikely that this will be of any use whatsoever. So again, I'm going to just pose a question to you in the chat. Do you find a lot of skimming and scanning activities in the teaching materials you use? Um, I'm interested to know how widespread this is around the world. And I see that we have people joining us from, from all over the place, from Mexico, um, from India. So I'm curious to see how much of a worldwide phenomenon this is. Again, please just type yes or no in the chat. Okay, and it's interesting. I'm seeing quite a lot of yeses. Yeses and absolutely yeses with lots of exclamation marks. Uh, yes, CELTA teaches it. Yes, no, I teach at primary. Okay, so that's uh, yes in India. It's a scan worldwide, I see. Okay, good. A lot of skimming, um, I see from Jenny. So. This is, uh, it's a widespread phenomenon. And I think, um, as I said, that, uh, as I mentioned before, this can be an opportunity cost and we maybe need to do something that's more helpful for our students instead. So I'm going to move on to the next, um, the next uh, misconception about teaching reading, uh, which is around guessing. And they're kind of linked actually, the idea that you read through text very quickly and then you guess all the words that you don't know. Uh, this is quite common, I think, in ELT. Um, uh, thinking. And the idea of guessing is really strongly associated with a reading researcher called Kenneth Goodman. And uh, he wrote a very influential paper called Reading, a Psycholinguistic Guessing Game, in which he stated, reading is a psycholinguistic guessing game. And what he was suggesting was that um, actually we didn't read, we don't read all the letters in words, uh, we kind of sample the text and we spend a lot of our time uh, predicting the words that are kind of going to come next, guessing the words uh, as we read. Um, and this was a very influential theory uh, that strongly impacted um, the teaching of reading, particularly in the USA in the 1970s. And um, his theory gave birth to an idea called the queuing system. And so, um, teachers would teach students um, from elementary school level upwards to look at three different clues when they're, when they're reading words and trying to guess what they, what they are. So one is semantic clues or meaning. And the question is, does it make sense? Uh, the other one is graphophonic. So that's to do with the spelling. Um, and the question is, does it look right? And the third one is uh, syntactic. Uh, so the word order and, and things like that. Um, and there the question is, does it sound right? So it's still, even to this day, uh, there are a lot of teachers who are, who are teaching students from a very young age when they're starting just to approach reading, um, that it's very important to guess um, the words that are written on the page. So what's the evidence for this claim? Well, actually, although uh, Goodman's uh, paper was influential and thought-provoking. Um, Eye-tracking studies since the 1970s show that readers do pay attention to all the letters in words. Um, and another theory, act uh, theory actually was that students relied on word shapes uh, as well to, to, to work out what, um, what kind of word they were reading. And this is also not true. Skilled readers do not ident identify words by their shapes they do identify them by their letters. So um, Goodman's theory, in fact, tr turned out not to be um, true. And skilled readers recognize words fluently or, and automatically, they're not guessing the words, they recognize them, them fluently and they're recognizing them so automatically that they don't have to think about them there. Um, and that's the mark of being a skilled reader. And this automatic recognition frees up mental space to think about and understand the contents of texts. 
So if you're constantly trying to work out what the words are, in fact, it makes it difficult to comprehend what you're reading because all your mental energy is focused um, on identifying the words. But if you can recognize them automatically, this gives your brain space to think about what the meaning of the, to think about the meaning of the texts. Here's a, a quote from uh, Professor Shanahan, who was on a, a very influential reading panel in the US. Um, and he says, the three queuing systems theory is still taught to many teachers and prospective teachers, which is a shame because it is descriptive of how poor readers read rather than how good ones do. So again, as I was, uh, as I said previously, good readers are not constantly guessing at words. Uh, they're not constantly predicting what word's gonna come next, not least not consciously. Um, in, instead, they are rapidly and automatically identifying the words as they see them. Now, again, I don't want to go too far um, and say that there's never any situation when we, we don't need to guess words or, or try and work them out from the context, that's not true. And one, uh, one very clear example of the role of context um, is this. So strong readers do use context to interpret the meaning of ambiguous words. For example, after identifying the word run, a skilled reader would use context to interpret which meaning is intended. So here's a sentence, I go for a run once or twice a week. And here the meaning of run um, is the, the one that pretty much everybody knows. However, in this sentence, I run my own company. This clearly has nothing to do with jogging or exercise. And here uh, a skilled reader would use context to work out that run here means is a synonym for manage. I manage my own company. So context is important. Um, but uh, the key point is we're not using context um, to guess all the words in sentences or a large number of words in sentences. We're identifying the words and then where necessary, we're using context to interpret what they mean. So we've looked at two key misconceptions, um, speed reading and, um, and the idea that we're constantly guessing when we read. And we've seen that evidence um, Recent evidence has shown that this is not true, that these ideas are, are mistaken. And after this seminar, um, you'll be able to, to download um, a handout which contains links to the studies um, which I've just been uh, talking about. So uh, there are references to, to all the points I've just made and you can access them when you, uh, when you download a handout at the end of the session. So the next question is, what is skilled reading? And an idea that's very helpful for understanding this is called the simple view of reading, which was proposed by researchers called Goff and, Goff and Tumner in 1986. And they said that reading is decoding times language comprehension. That's what equals reading comprehension. So decoding means being able to recognize the words on the page. And language comprehension means being able to understand the meaning of the text if you hear it. So if someone read the text to you and you could understand it, that's language comprehension. Uh, but decoding is, is recognizing the words on the page. And these are both highly dependent upon each other. So if you can say the sounds of the words on the page, but you don't understand what they're meaning, their meaning, your language, your language comprehension is low, so your reading comprehension will be low. On the other hand, if you can understand the words when you hear them, but you don't recognize them when they're on the page, uh, then your decoding is low. And of course, your reading comprehension will be low. And this simple view of reading is a very helpful way to approach the skill of reading and, and what we need to do to help students become better readers. So first, let's have a look at decoding. And this depends on, uh, first of all, the, the skill of phonological awareness. And phonological awareness is being able to break words down into component sounds. So, for example, if you hear uh, the word big, you could break it into the three sounds of b, i, g. Um, and we can see um, whether students have phonological awareness by asking them to change some of these these phonemes. So for example, if you change the b to p, you get pig. If you change the i to a, you get bag. If you change the uh, 
g to m, you get bin, this kind of thing. For second language, foreign language learners, uh, the first stage in phonological awareness is actually just knowing the sounds of English, so knowing, being able to hear and recognize words uh, in, in English. Um, I mean, this is something that first language learners of uh, first language learners of uh, first language readers uh, obviously bring with them when they start to read. If you're learning English as a second language, uh, then the first stage may just be hearing the sounds of English and, and, and learning some words uh, orally. So how is phon phonological awareness and decoding linked? Well, skilled readers can break words into sounds, into phonemes, and map these sounds to spellings. So for example, the word frighten, they can identify the, the sounds fr, i, t, u, n, and they can link these to the, the spellings, which you can see below. And notice that, for example, the sound i is linked to the spelling i-g-h. So phonological awareness develops as you learn to recognize the sounds of words. Um, and uh, this is the first key stage. You need to know some words in English uh, and be able to understand them when you hear them, maybe say them yourself. It's affected by both hearing the sounds of English and by learning to read and write the letters that represent those sounds. And for fluent readers, word recognition becomes automatic. That means we do it without thinking about it. Um, so you can see with a beginner reader, they might sound out words. For example, the, the example I gave before of big, a beginner reader might go b, e, g, b, big. But fluent readers don't do this. They see the letters and they automatically recognize uh, the word on the page. Now, it's quite traditional um, in many countries in the world, certainly in Japan, for EFL teachers to, to not teach phonological awareness and to not teach uh, individual letter sounds. Instead, what often happens is they, that teachers teach words as whole words. Uh, in Japan, for example, using flashcards, uh, teacher will show the word in English, maybe they'll say the word and then they'll show the, the Japanese word on the back of the card. So here's an example, maybe uh, this student in the illustration that's called that Student, student one, she's learning whole words in her lessons. And in today's lesson, she learned the word insects. So the teacher showed her the word insects and she said, insects, insects. And then maybe she said, maybe it's mushi in Japanese. So as a result, with a lot of practice, this student can recognize this one word. But it's not very efficient actually, because there are so many words and so many different, um, uh, so many words to learn it's not a very efficient way of learning um, to read. So let's look at an alternative. This is student two. Student two learns letter sounds. He also read the word insects in class today, but because he can read a lot of other, uh, because he can recognize letter sounds, he can also read a lot of other words with the same letters, like ten and tent and net and nets. So we can see that Whereas student one can only remember words taught by the teacher, student two is becoming an independent reader. And this is a really big argument in favor of teaching um, individual letter sounds and letter sp uh, and sound spelling. It helps students to become more independent. And there's in fact a, a well-known, uh, there is in fact an influential theory called the self-teaching hypothesis, which suggests that if we can break words down into sounds and we map them to spellings, we can teach ourselves a lot of new words um, without even the teacher doing this for us. But the question you might be asking is, okay, this is very clear in first language, for first language readers, but are letter sounds and phonological awareness useful for EFL students? EFL students have the disadvantage that they often don't hear um, the words of English around them, so they only learn the words that are taught to them in, in school. So they don't have the same advantages um, as we've just seen necessarily. However, um, while there is less research in this area for EFL reading, um, a 2021 meta-analysis found positive effects of teaching phonemic awareness combined with phonics teaching. And if you're interested in that study, um, you can access it using the QR code that I've just put up on the screen. The size of the impact depends on various factors, for example, students 
whether students um, have a first language which is alphabetic or not, the length of time that they're taught and how old they are when they're taught phonemic awareness and uh, uh, phonological awareness and phonics. And better quality studies are needed for EFL reading. It's under-researched, I think, this area. Uh, but certainly um, there's evidence that uh, this is useful for second language learners as well. And we've certainly found um, in teacher training projects and curriculum projects that we've been working on in Japan that students definitely do benefit um, from, from this kind of teaching that teaches them how to, to link the sounds of English to, to spellings. So the key points are we should help students to link the sounds and spellings of words. This will help them become more independent readers. We should also recognize that word recognition requires effort to start with, but through reading practice, students will learn to recognize words automatically. So that means that actually students need quite a lot of practice to get to that um, automaticity. Decoding is only one side of the, the, the equation. Language comprehension is the other. And language comprehension depends on students' ability to make sense of words, phrases, sentences, and paragraphs. So of course, of course, all the things we do in EFL lessons where we teach vocabulary, where we teach grammar, um, where we break down uh, paragraphs and, and teach text structure, this is all very useful, very important for, for students reading comprehension. But one area that maybe we are less aware of, uh, but is also important, is students' background knowledge. And this is something we might overlook, uh, when, especially when we're teaching um, reading, as a, reading in English as a foreign language, but it is an important factor. And there's a, a, a study called the Baseball Study, which um, illustrates this effect of background knowledge very clearly. I'd like to briefly explain the study to you so you can understand how it works. So in this study, the researchers took four groups and each group read a text about a baseball game. And the students, uh, the children read the text and then they had a, a, a model of a baseball uh, pitch and they moved the um, pieces around the baseball pitch to represent what was in the text about this baseball game, and this measured their comprehension. So here are the four groups. Group one had strong readers who were baseball fans and knowledgeable about baseball. Group two had strong uh, readers, but they were not baseball fans. They didn't know much about reading. So, sorry, they didn't know much about baseball. Group three were weak readers, but they were baseball fans. And group four were weak readers and they were not baseball fans. So based on this, which groups do you think, what, what, which groups do you think would, would be the most effective readers? I'd like to, to predict for a moment which order you think they'll go in. And now I'll show you the results of this uh, study. So unsurprisingly, group one, the strong readers who were baseball fans or knowledgeable about baseball, they uh, were the most successful readers. But interestingly, group two, who were strong readers, were not as good at comprehending the text as group three, who were weaker readers, but they had a high knowledge of, of baseball. And this just goes to show uh, that the, the effect of background knowledge is, is really important um, in reading comprehension. Uh, and here is a reference to that study if you're interested. And again, it will be in the handout that uh, you can download at the end of this uh, presentation. So you might be wondering how this works. I'm going to give you a, an illustrative example here. So um, this, I think, maybe will work differently for people in, let's say, India and people based in, let's say, South America. So here's a text. Um, I'll briefly read it to you. Taylor works the ball off his pads to fine leg and sprints through for two. Very nearly another run out there as Ambrose trashes down the stumps an inch or two too late. Mills adds another boundary to take him through to 37. Mills then sweeps the ball straight to Bell at silly mid on. Now, again, it's likely that um, if you are a cricket fan, uh, this was very easy to understand and you had no comprehension problems at all. And if you know nothing about cricket, 
it was possibly extremely confusing. And the reason for this is not to do with necessarily the vocabulary. These are quite straightforward words, works, fine, leg, run, but it's the context they're being used in and your background knowledge of the rules and the scoring system of cricket, which will, which will influence how well you understood this text. So it's important to know that background knowledge helps us visualize the situation being described in the text. It helps us make sense of familiar words being used in unfamiliar ways. It helps us work out what the writer means, even if they leave out key information. And this is known as the as inference. Uh, An inference, working out what the writer means, even if they don't say it, um, is something that we sometimes practice when we're teaching reading, but it depends very heavily on background knowledge. So in the text I just showed you, the writer did not explain the rules of cricket. The writer did not explain how scoring works because they assumed that the readers of that article would already know this. And that's quite common uh, when you write a text, you assume that the reader knows some things. Uh, you have to assume this, otherwise your text would become incredibly long and, and very boring um, for a lot of people trying to read it. So to summarize then, the key elements of skilled reading, and this is taken from a um, from a uh, from the the reading room, which was 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 um, designed by uh, Scarborough in two thousand and one, a reading researcher. The key elements of skilled reading are, are vocabulary, language structures, syntax, grammar, etc., which I think we're all familiar with. Verbal reasoning, so being able to explain. Um, uh, uh, what you've uh, what you've understood, literacy knowledge, so print concepts, um, how different kinds of writing work um, and are different from each other. Background knowledge, as we've just looked at, and decoding, which we've also looked at. And once we know that these are the key elements of skilled reading, it gives us quite helpful hints into what we can do when we're teaching reading effectively, leaving aside the flawed and flawed misconceptions that I referred to earlier. So I'd like to, to come towards the, the last part of this presentation and look at some helpful ideas about teaching reading, ignoring the misconceptions and, and focusing on what we know about skilled reading. So first of all, and most obviously, uh, we need to teach students about sounds and spelling, and ideally starting from when students are beginners. We can do this by teaching the sounds of the alphabet and the most common spelling patterns. And we can consolidate this with reading aloud activities. So it's quite important if you're teaching students um, knowledge about the alphabet and sounds that they get a chance to practice using this knowledge. Otherwise, it just seems like something that's you know, quite irrelevant to them. Um, when you introduce the sounds of the alphabet, it's quite common to introduce the alphabet A, B, C, D, E, F, G in that order. But one interesting way of doing it is to introduce the letters in the order of the most common spellings of English. So here is um, a way that you can start the, introducing the, the alphabet using the letters S, A, T, P, I, N, which are representing the sounds S, A, T, I, and N. And already, if you teach students these uh, six phonemes, these six sounds of letters, um, they can already immediately from their first couple of lessons start to, to say words in English. They can say pin, they can say sat, they can say tin, they can say sit. And so already straight away, we're helping them to see how letter sounds and reading are linked. This is an example list of letter sounds uh, from a a popular reading scheme um, in the UK and in other countries around the world called Jolly Phonics. There are other um, orders that you can also use. Uh, individual letter sounds aren't enough. There's other common sound spelling patterns that are important, especially in English. There's lots of uh, different vowel spellings. Uh, so here are uh, five common spellings for the vowel sound A which can be spelled with A-I as in train, main and brain, A-Y as in day, play and say, A uh, consonant E, sometimes called A magic E, 
as in plate, calculate and save. EA, a bit more rare as in stake and great, or EIGH as in the number eight or weigh or weight. So teaching these is also important um, because without knowing these um, more slightly more complex spelling patterns, um, English seems extremely irregular. But when you start to teach these, uh, these uh, vowel spelling patterns, it becomes a lot more regular. You start to see a lot more patterns in, in the words, uh, the spellings of English. As well as teaching systematically, you can also do incidental teaching. That means that you teach new words as they appear in the text. It's good to combine both. And you can do this by breaking down how the sounds and spelling are linked. And it's, I find it's most easy to go from sound to spelling, not the other way around. If you go from spelling to sound, you have to do a lot of very complex explanations, which can be confusing for students. But if you go from sound to spelling, it's nice and simple and straightforward. So I'm going to give you an example. Um, let's imagine that uh, in a text you have the word qualification. So I'm going to help students to recognise and maybe spell the word qualification. So first of all, here it is. Qualification. 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 And if I was teaching Japanese students, I'd say this is shikaku in Japanese because it's very important that students know the meaning of any words uh, that they're trying to read or spell. OK, so qualification has a tricky sound. The first one is O, oh, spelt with the letter A. A usually spells the sound A, but in this word it spells the sound O, oh, qualification. And it's the same in these other words, want and was, where the letter A spells the sound O. Oh. There's one more slightly tricky part, the sh qualification. And the sh is spelt with the letters T and I, like in station and patient. So let's look at the word one more time, qualification. So this is an example teaching technique that you can use if you're teaching words that come up, especially if you're teaching secondary learners where you know, the basic sounds are fine, but some of the new words are difficult for them to, to read or to spell. So first of all, the key point is to say the word clearly, and if it's a long word, break it into syllables. So qualification, qualification, let's break it into five syllables. Make sure students understand the meaning of the word. That's very important. And show the spelling. Highlight the tricky bits. So it was the O spelt with the letter A and the SH spelt with the letters TI in qualification. And show other examples using familiar words. So I used was and want, for example, station, which helps students see these are, are patterns of spelling. So that's one example of a practical uh, technique you can use. It's important to practice oral reading as well. Here's a quote from Mark Seidenberg, who was a, who's a well uh, respected reading researcher and who wrote the interesting book Language at the Speed of Sight. He says, children who struggle when reading texts aloud do not become good readers if left to read silently. Their disfluency merely becomes inaudible. Reading aloud and silent comprehension are causally connected. So it's what's clear from this is that we actually need to hear students reading aloud. It's a bit of a taboo I have found in EFL uh, reading. Some people say that they don't like reading aloud, but it's actually a very important part of learning to read um, English, whether it's your first language or second language. Oral reading by students helps to link spellings and sounds, as, we, as we've seen. It gives hints on comprehension issues. If we hear students pausing in strange places, uh, we can maybe imagine that they're struggling to understand what they're reading. And it makes any decoding or fluency issues clear to the teacher. So if the student is taking a very long time uh, to sound out each word, then we know that maybe they need some extra practice. And if they're reading silently, we have no idea, we have no insight into what the problem is, whether it's they don't understand the word or they can't read the word, we don't know. So oral reading gives lots of important information to the teacher. Uh, one note of caution though, 
uh, if I've sometimes seen classes where the teacher will ask one student to read to the class, maybe there'll be 40 students, 39 of them are listening and one is reading. There's some issues with this. It can be embarrassing for that student, especially if they're a weak reader uh, and they may give a poor model for other students. And it can be tricky to give feedback without humiliating that student. Moreover, other students in the class get reduced reading time. You've got one student reading, 39 listening. If the student's not doing a very good job, then the other students also maybe not be listening very carefully. So I don't particularly recommend uh, this style of oral reading instruction, but something that is quite helpful is what's called paired oral reading. And that's where students take turns to read a paragraph aloud to each other in pairs, is an illustration that shows it. So maybe the girl on the left reads first and the boy listens, and then they, swap, then they switch roles and the boy reads and the girl listens. And if either of them are having trouble reading words, the other one can coach them and help them. They can give each other feedback and coaching, as I said, and the teacher can monitor the class and give feedback. So while students are reading in pairs, the teacher can walk around listening. The teacher can give individual feedback if necessary or whole class feedback uh, if they hear lots of students having the same kind of problems. Uh, repeated reading is also another technique that can be helpful. Also, oral reading by the teacher is helpful. It allows the teacher to show students fluent reading to scaffold understanding, that means to support students' understanding, for example, by using intonation and pausing to make the meaning of words of sentences clearer, to gloss vocabulary, to, that means to explain vocabulary, uh, maybe in, in students' first language, and also to model thinking and reading strategies, so what to do when you get stuck. Um, not going to pose you this question. I'd like you just to think by yourself how often you use oral reading activities in your English lessons. And maybe you might have a question about this uh, in the Q&A at the end, but I'd like to move on so that we finish, the time, finish in time for some Q&A. So the last point is um, we can teach background knowledge. Um, it's important to choose any background knowledge that we teach. And so when you do this, it's important to look at the te text you're teaching and ask yourself these questions. What background information does the writer assume readers already know? And are my students likely to know that background information? If not, how can I teach this information in a clear, engaging and efficient way? And we're going to look at a quick example. This is taken from Learn English Kids. So it's aimed at primary school children. And it's a text about saving water. And in the text, we have these sentences. That's OK. There's a lot of water on our planet. True. But did you know that we can't use most of it? That's because it's salt water in seas and oceans or fresh water, which is ice or in the ground. Now, if you're teaching using this text in a young learner classroom, in a class of primary or elementary school students. There's some assumed information here that I'm not sure the children will necessarily know. And um, if you look at that, I wonder what background knowledge you think might help students to understand this text better. I think that it's this sentence here, especially if students are not uh, live a long way from the sea or they haven't been taught um, about salt water yet. And they might think, well, why can't we drink salt water? Um, and so if we're using this text, we need to be prepared if students ask questions or if they don't seem to understand the text to give them some information about this. The simple information is it makes us sick. A more detailed information is that the salt damages our kidneys, which you can see in the illustration. The kidneys try to get rid of the salt using water. So we lose more water than we drink. That's why we can't drink salt water. This kind of information also actually enlivens the text for students. A note of caution though, try to avoid telling students information that they can gain themselves from reading the text. So for example, if the teacher says, we're going to read it about water, did you know that we can only use around 1% of the water on the planet? That's because this is information that students can work out for themselves by reading the text. Um, the text tells them this information, so we don't need to explain it to them before they read. In fact, if we do this, 
if we explain all the information in the text to students, they lose the chance to practice the mental processes of reading comprehension. And it also removes students' reason for reading. And I think a good analogy for this is if you went to a film and your friend told you how it ended, you'd perhaps be less motivated to watch the film. It's the same for reading. I think we need to remember that the mental work of trying to understand text is a key part of reading, so we shouldn't uh, rob students of the opportunity to think about what they're reading. But, as I said, there may be occasions where students' background knowledge doesn't allow them to understand the text, and that's where we can, we can help with some brief and, um, and helpful teaching. Finally, some other useful ideas. Getting students to discuss the text in pairs in their first language tends to lead to deeper, deeper discussions, deeper understanding. Teaching strategies for breaking down long, complex sentences is useful for students because long, complex sentences are often the topic sentences, the key ones that students need to understand in a paragraph. Teaching students about different text genres and text organisation, that's important. And raising students' curiosity about the texts they're about to read. It's also important, uh, curiosity is linked very clearly to reading comprehension. Uh, and one way of doing this is to take a content-led approach to reading texts. That means you don't say, we're going to read this text to learn a lot of new grammar and vocabulary. Instead, you introduce the text based on the topic um, of the text and, and get students curious and interested in finding out more about that topic. That uh, final summary, so skilled reading involves recognising words automatically and reading them fluently. This gives students time to think about the meaning of the text they're reading and background knowledge is also important for reading comprehension. And that's all for me. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks very much, Robin. It's great. Really, really interesting. Lots in there, huge amount in there, actually. Um, and I think uh, certainly from the comments that we've been getting throughout, it's been uh, it's been uh, a very uh, useful <laughs> session for, um, for everyone. So thank you um, for all of that. I think, yeah, we could should probably get you back and do another one. Um, expand on some of this. Uh, okay, uh, we've just got a few minutes actually for questions. Um, you can hopefully see the Q and A um, if there's any that you sort of think might be worth picking out. Um, one that might be interesting is actually the last one that's in there. How can we raise avid readers when kids and teens nowadays prefer gadgets over books? I Man, and that's sort of perhaps not exactly relevant to some of the techniques and stuff you've been talking about, but it was something that I was thinking about while you were talking, having two sort of teenage children who um, getting them to read is like getting blood from a stone uh, sometimes. So I just sort of wondered if you had any, a, a sort of a, a golden nugget of, of, of advice there on that one. <laughs> I'm actually in a fairly similar situation um, with okay. two, <laughs> two children, a teenager and a near teenager at home. I don't, uh, I think, um, yeah, I think one of the problems is that gadgets are actually are very, they're designed to be addictive. And so uh, it's its very, if you've got a gadget in one hand and a book in the other, the gadget is most likely to win your attention. It's been designed to suck up your uh, attention. So mm. making sure there is some non-gadget time in the, in students' lives um, yeah. where they have no <laughs> no other option but to, uh, to do some reading to pass the time is, is probably an important tip to think about. But that's um, maybe not something I, I, I've got any great pearls of wisdom to go on, unfortunately. Uh, okay. <laughs> I've tried bribery and uh, offering money. <laughs> but so, I mean, yeah, one thing that's interesting, I think, I mean, just sort of just on that and going back a little bit to sort of my son particularly was now 19. Um, when he was sort of younger, he read all of the Harry Potter books. Um, mm. And I, I don't know, I mean, it sort of relates a little bit to your the sort of the baseball um, experiment mm. you were talking about if, you, if you're actually kind of interested in something or the topic then it's then maybe that maybe it's a case of finding something that they're actually interested in and not necessarily expecting them to read a whole big book um, but you know reading something um, on the topic that isn't that's interesting to them maybe is is something um, yeah I think curiosity is a really key part of reading comprehension and, and obviously curiosity yeah. is going to play a role in motivation as well absolutely yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, I can see a, a question from, from Maya Cutlack saying, I, I find reading aloud lowers the student's comprehension significantly. And how do you deal with it? And that's a, a good question I'd like to just briefly yeah. touch upon. Yeah. And I think, yes, it is likely to uh, initially, especially for 
beginner students, they're devoting so much time to kind of decoding the words that there's not much space left for them to understand what they're reading. And that's where rereading is actually quite important. So don't just go with one, one read and then ask them, what did you understand? Give them a chance to think about it and reread it uh, and maybe discuss with a partner what they've understood. Uh, it's that that is likely to both increase their fluency and give them the mental space to, to think about what they've just read. Mm. Um, and I've had exactly the same thing when I went to a Japanese lesson and we were asked to read aloud a Japanese text around the class. I, I was able to I was able to answer the questions to the student who'd read aloud, but not my own. Mm -hmm. When I had to read aloud the passage and I was asked a question, I couldn't I couldn't answer it because I've spent so much effort trying to just read it okay. aloud. Yeah, yeah. OK. All right. Interesting. Um, OK, one more quick one, possibly. Uh, I've got a question from Rebecca. English as additional language students in my previous school in the UK had good phonological awareness and could read aloud fluently, but had poor comprehension. Um, what would be your advice to improve their comprehension? Sort of relates a little bit to, um, to the yes. last one, I suppose. But um... yeah, absolutely. So I think you need to check first of all that they the vocabulary. Uh, also, you know, reading aloud to students. So reading to students is also a very valuable activity. In fact, mm -hmm. um, <clears> because um, then they have they haven't got the pressure of trying to decode the words themselves, mm -hmm. and you can you can uh, check their understanding of the words, you can feed in any necessary background knowledge, you can, you know, if the text structure is unfamiliar to them, you can help them with that. So a combination of reading to students and, and student discussions uh, and inputting, you know, um, background knowledge, vocabulary, that kind of thing is important. Mm -hmm. it, it, I think there, there's an expression barking at text, which is sometimes where students can say words, but they don't know what they mean. And that's obviously not reading. Um, no understanding the words is a key part of it yeah okay brilliant um and fascinating thanks ever so much of them we've kind of run out of time um it's a shame because it'd be good to carry on with this but uh thank you ever so much um to you robin and thank you to everyone uh participating thank you to um to melissa and joe for moderating um and also to louise uh moderating the facebook as well um and thank you to everyone in facebook who's been watching as well as in zoom um we've got another session coming up in 15 minutes um so we're going to leave this one now and hopefully see most of you uh in the uh the next session in 15 minutes time so again thanks robin and thanks everyone and see thanks, you all Paul. soon thank you. cheers